Hello, I'm Phil Simon, and I met a bunch of you already. I'm the author of four books, including The Age of the Platform, and today we're going to talk about management in this new age. But I'd like to start off by getting everybody up. So if you could stand up for a second. You won't be standing for long. Go ahead and have a seat if you use anything from Amazon. Kindle, Nook, buy books on the site. Wow. Okay. Two, three left. Wow. How about Facebook? <laughs> we just set a new record. I've done this about five or six times, and I usually have to get to Apple or Google before everybody's sitting. So that is a first. Um, I'd also like a volunteer. Someone could just stand up for a second. <laughs> Here you go, keep one and two people you want. All right. Is that on? Let's check it. That's right. That's true. <laughs> but it's not back. <laughs> okay. By the way, if anyone wants to find me later, I'll go ahead and sign a book. That's the reason you write them, right? So you can sign them. <laughs> so around 18 months ago or so, I just finished writing my third book, The New Small, and it was about 11 companies, and no one had ever heard of them. It was about how those companies were using emerging technologies. So in my own sort of pivot, I said to myself, well, what about four companies that everybody's using, everybody's heard of? And I stumbled across Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. And I wasn't the only one who sort of had this revelation. And Eric Schmidt, who's a reasonably smart guy, at the time he was CEO of Google, now he's chairman of the board, talked about the gang of four. Four companies that were exploiting platform strategies really well. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. So I said to myself, hmm, I may be onto something here. Ironically, if you take a look at Schmidt's quote, it's very much a dig at Microsoft. Right? <laughs> we talked before, over um, about an hour ago, about the major tech companies that had been really trailblazing and doing interesting things. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, it wasn't always that way, right? Microsoft, AOL, Yahoo, MySpace, all 10 years ago were in much stronger positions than they are today. So what is it about these four companies that's really so interesting and it's redefining business and it's their business strategy, it's the platform. So that's what we're gonna talk about today with a particular bent on management. And after I talk, we'll, we'll definitely have time for some questions. To me, probably the single most amazing thing about the Gang of Four is that nobody who stood up and then immediately sat down used Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google because they had to. You all do it because you want to, right? Is anybody compelled to use Google here? I'm curious, right? So you, why do you use these companies' products and services? The Gang of Four, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Again, by virtue of their platforms, they've ushered in a new age. Welcome to the age of the platform. Now, I'm sort of big on language, and one of the things that really irritates me is this misuse of the term platform. Back in Las Vegas on Sunday, and someone was talking about really cool platforms like Netflix. And he was a nice guy, and I don't think he meant any harm, but to me, Netflix isn't a platform. It's an incredibly useful service. I've myself been a Netflix subscriber, but what exactly can I build on top of Netflix? Nothing. Netflix doesn't have an open API. Now, that's not because Reed Hastings isn't a smart guy. He is. And there are legal reasons, right, in terms of intellectual property, contracts that you can't say, sure, why don't you go mash up The Godfather or Reservoir Dogs or Boondock Saints or some of the movies that we are talking about before. So what do we really mean here by platforms? First up, little p versus big P. Technology platforms with a little p, I would argue, have been around for a really long time. I'm talking about operating systems. I'm talking about even something like a telephone line. In the book, which most of you hopefully have read, I'm talking about the platform as a business model. Okay, so big P, right? That way, Netflix is not a platform. Amazon, Apple, Facebook. I also talk about Twitter, uh, WordPress, LinkedIn, right? Those are emerging platforms as well. And a platform really is nothing. Oh, I'm sorry, one slide ahead. It's really a fundamentally new business model, and scores of companies are embracing it. I would argue, as I do in the book, that I actually have embraced the platform as a type of thinking by having these different planks. In 2008, when I wrote my first book, I made all of my money, 100%, from one very specific type of niche consulting. And I realized that even though in 2008, when the economy was tanking, I had my best year ever, that was actually very dangerous, right? Because what if that dried up? How else would I pay my mortgage? So I diversified my business over the last four years. 
I'm telling you this not to brag, but because any organization, any person can embrace platform thinking. And that's some of the things that I'll talk about today uh, with regard to embracing uncertainty, with regard to management. You have to be comfortable with not knowing how things are going to turn out. Okay. So a platform is a set of integrated planks, features, apps, products, services. To make this a little bit more concrete for you, in 1995, when Jeff Bezos launched Amazon.com, it was pretty much a one-trick pony, right? It sold books online. It made a lot of money, but it was just doing one thing. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I would argue that Amazon would not have been become such an amazing company if it hadn't diversified, if Jeff Bezos hadn't gotten away from just selling one thing. And you saw that as Amazon evolved, he started selling CDs, right? He started selling DVDs. And then they got into things like cloud computing. So last year, Amazon made about $850 million in pure profit from basically selling excess cloud services that it didn't need from its data centers. Right? You're spending billions of dollars, you're just letting it go to waste into the ether, why not sell it? Right? Amazon has embraced hardware, it's a publisher now, it's working with authors like Tim Ferriss, it has self-publishing tools on its site. Amazon does so many different things, it doesn't just sell books, it has many planks in its platform. Okay. And to me, the most powerful platforms embrace ecosystems. You want developers, in a way, innovating for you. I'm talking about open APIs. Right? That's why you have, with the App Store, you have different apps there. Right? You have scores of developers uh, doing different things. You have authors publishing their books on Amazon, or you have artists putting their songs directly into iTunes. That's what I'm talking about with an ecosystem. In the book, I talk about how Steve Jobs was obviously a reasonably smart guy. You can't tell me, though, that four years ago, he said, I'm going to launch the App Store, and Angry Birds will be downloaded 400 million times. You can't possibly know that. Okay? So, again, I talked about vibrant ecosystems. And Google's another example of a company that has embraced platform thinking. In 1998, when Larry and Sergey started the company, Google was a search engine, and I was around for early search engines like Lycos and AltaVista or some of the other god-awful ones in hindsight. Yahoo search was terrible, right? Ask Jeeves, okay? So Google comes along and it finds a way to do search better and actually to monetize search as well, right? And to this day, Google makes 90% of its money basically through ads that show up on search. But Google decided to change, right? Why basically break what it, or fix what isn't broken? Why become a platform? And there's a really interesting book, if you haven't read it, called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, who's a um, professor over at Harvard. And he talks about how companies have a very strong disincentive to innovate because they want to protect what's theirs. Uh, Jay, you had talked about uh, Kodak or Polaroid. Fascinating statistic. Guess when Kodak actually invented digital film? What year? Anyone? Okay, you actually went under. I'm 1975. And now Kodak is, I believe, in uh, bankruptcy yeah. and is trying to sell some of its patents. It's suing Apple. Um, I can't imagine buying Kodak stock. So you had a company that saw the future. I guarantee you, I was very young in 1975, but there were probably people <coughs> that were saying, no, 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 this will disrupt our business. In the Isaacson book, Steve Jobs talks about how your business is going to be cannibalized. The only, diff the only question is who's going to do it. Is it going to be you or your competition? And Microsoft's another example of a company that's had some real challenges, right? Microsoft has made most of its money through its flagship products, Windows and Office. And if you go back 15 years, there really weren't very many alternatives. Well, Microsoft has really been struggling. If you look at its stock over the last 15 years, I know because I had bought the stock for a while, it has really flatlined because it hasn't embraced some of these new technologies. It was very late to get on board with the cloud. Why? Because it, you used to buy disks and install them. That's very different than getting your software over the web as a service. So with Google, we know why it became a platform. It did not want to be disintermediated. It was not hard for Larry and Sergey to see basically the world in which we're rapidly approaching, right? where you don't need to be at a proper computer, where you can search for things over a smartphone or over a tablet, where mobility was key. So we know why Google did what it did. Let's talk about how. Okay. Google added different planks to its platform. I'm talking about Gmail, uh, Android, Plus, Blogger, YouTube. Back in 2007, I remember people were outraged. This is the dot-com bubble dot two, or 2.0, two right? You are paid 1.65 for a company that lets you upload videos of dancing cats. You guys are insane. 
Well, Google has found a way to monetize YouTube. And in fact, I would argue that Facebook saw a very similar parallel in paying uh, around a time about a billion dollars in cash and stock for Instagram a few months ago. Google has found a way to monetize YouTube. People like uh, Jay-Z, Madonna, Ashton Kutcher are being paid a lot of money to develop exclusive content for YouTube, not to mention the ads that you can see on them. So Google found a way to monetize it. Google didn't want to make all of its money from traditional index search and ads. Now it still does. But that's why you see Google getting into things like Google Plus. Okay? So Google became a platform by embracing this type of thinking. One of the things that I address in the book is what do these companies have in common? And they frequently add planks to their platforms, and some of them don't always succeed. Right? If we talk about Google Plus for a moment, that's, by my count, at least the fourth bite at the apple that Google's had with regard to building a valuable social plank. Uh, there was Orkut, there was Buzz, and then there was, um, what was the other one? Wave, right? So you had these three attempts that for different reasons didn't work, okay? So what else do they have in common? Okay, it's a little non-responsive, but uh, we'll get it to work. Okay, they're more consumer-oriented than business-oriented. As we talked about before, everybody uses these companies' products and services, not because they have to, but because they want to. Um, there's a term that has been coined about five, six years ago called the consumer consumerization of IT. Right? We no longer necessarily use the best technology when we come to work and sit down at our desktops. In fact, I had heard that the iPhone, which is my smartphone of choice, has more computing power than the largest computer in the world that was probably twice the size of this room in 1950. So we have access to information and data and apps everywhere we go. Right? These companies also embrace emerging technologies like the cloud, like mobility. Is, is this thing on the WebEx? Is that why there's a little bit of a delay? Just curious. Okay, I'll figure it out. So they're rooted in emerging technologies. Apple is the one exception to this rule. Yes, they embrace the cloud, but Apple was founded in was either late 75 or early 1976. Apple was not a cloud or internet native company. Okay, they had to see where the world is going and make some big changes. Many companies, Polaroid, Kodak, et cetera, have not made those changes. But Amazon, Google, Facebook, were all basically born in the internet era. And there's one more thing that these companies have in common. I can borrow from Steve Jobs for a minute. Iconic leaders. Now, Steve Jobs, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but he was, and maybe forever will be, Apple. Mark Zuckerberg is Facebook, and I'm not just talking about being the face of the company. When they did the IPO, they structured it in such a way that Zuckerberg has 57% share of the voting stock, right? You can't get anything by or done in Facebook without getting him to sign off on it. Okay, Larry and Sergey, always synonymous with Google. Jeff Bezos, actually an interesting story. Um, he is very much a self-admitted geek. And I can relate. He did this interview a few years ago in which he talked about how he was debating in 1994 to start Amazon.com. And he was making, I don't know, two, three dollars $300,000 a year as a hedge fund employee, basically a quant guy, very good with numbers and uh, technology. And he said to himself, what would happen if I were 80 years old and I started Amazon and it failed? Could I live with myself? Would I look back at my life? And he said, if I started and I failed, I could live with myself. And if I, started, and if I didn't start it, I couldn't. He had built what he called, and I love this term, a regret minimization framework. <laughs> so <laughs> vintage Jeff Bezos. But he was willing to take that kind of risk. And you see that at Amazon to this day, when Amazon enters a new market. Right, people, I'm sure, said, well, what, what are you guys, crazy? You're going to sell compute power to small businesses? They're an online bookstore. Well, again, last year Amazon made $850 million, and this year it's going to make something like $2.5 billion from Amazon Web Services. It's incredible. Okay. So I want to spend today to uh, focusing on management lessons from the Gang of Four. Okay? And in particular, when I was working with Mark on developing the content for this presentation, he wanted me to talk about five things. Strategy, people, structure, rewards, and process. So we'll talk a bit about all of these. Now, first up, all these things are related. right? I don't care how good your strategy is. If you don't have the right people, you're in trouble. Okay? And remember, by itself, a platform guarantees nothing, right? Go ahead and build a platform for beepers. No one's buying beepers anymore, okay? So we're gonna talk about specific lessons from Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google with regard to these five things. And as I said, there'll be plenty of time for questions. Strategy. 
as I talked about before, for some of you who are here, culture eats strategy for lunch. In, in 2009, Microsoft, a company that had been historically very uh, reluctant to embrace cloud computing, finally said, okay, we get it. We're a cloud company now. Not that simple. You don't really wave a, a magic wand. Okay, Google, by launching Plus, which by most accounts has been successful, at least its most successful effort in the social arena, Google fundamentally did not become a social company. It's funny. There was um, an interview with um, Larry Page on Charlie Rose about two or three months ago. And I'm watching it. Did anyone see that, by the way? Show of hands. Okay. Gotta love Charlie Rose. Every author's dream is to be at that table. Anyway, Larry Page is talking about everything, and you can tell that first and foremost, he's a technology guy, right? For him, he can't crack the code to be able to index with uh, the results of Google, right? So for him, it's a technical problem, okay? And everything sort of stems from Larry Page at that company. He's a technology, it's a data-driven company, and we'll talk more about that later. So you don't all of a sudden become a social company because you launch a social plank. There's something to be said for your DNA, okay? Next up. In the book, I quote, I believe it's Jerry Brown, who talks about planning and how silly it is because I think the quote is something like, everyone loves to plan because no one has to do anything. Okay? Um, a couple of weeks ago on Bloomberg West, they had an interview with Google's head of acquisitions, right, the VP. They said, what's your budget? He goes, we have no budget. What do you mean? Well, think about it. If you had a minimum amount that you had to spend on acquisitions, you'd spend it, right? In most organizations, it's use it or lose it. Right? So if you've got $2 million or whatever that is, and you don't spend $2 million, let's say you spend $1.7, $1.8, what's your budget going to be next year? $1.7 or $1.8, if you're lucky. Right? Conversely, if you have a max, what if an opportunity presents itself that's too good to pass up, like, oh, I don't know, Motorola, which Google paid, what, uh, $12.5 billion for? He said, you think our budget was $12.5 was $12 billion? Of course it wasn't. So an opportunity came up and they jumped on it. So they have no budget. It doesn't mean that they make acquisitions willy-nilly, but they realize that they have to jump in when the opportunity presents itself. Also, you'll find that these companies quickly adapt and make mistakes. A couple of months ago, Apple pulled out of EP, which I'm not going to cheat. I can't memorize this. You want to talk about clunky acronyms? It's the Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool. Say that five times fast. Essentially, it's a way for organizations to be monitored to see if their practices are environmentally friendly. And Apple pulled out, and there was an outrage, right? And everyone has a megaphone these days. Apple is a very high visibility company, right? If you look at what Apple's doing with Foxconn, are they doing the right thing in terms of labor practices? I would argue yes. If they didn't, would they get called out on it? I would argue absolutely yes. I mean, look at the uh, NFL the other night. Uh, wasn't it something like 60,000 tweets per second on that call with the Packers game? They said something like when Obama accepted, it was 56,000. When Romney accepted, it was 17. So it says something about our culture when the NFL trumps them both. So everyone has a voice now. And if you make a mistake like Apple did, you know, Tim Cook two days later said, yeah, we screwed up. We're back in. We'll comply. So these companies quickly admit mistakes. People, the key element. If I go back to my grad school days, I'll remember like it was yesterday. You can break basically all organizations down into four processes, uh, four items, core processes, information technology, or structure and people. Well, all those things can be copied, but people can't. Okay? If you look at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, do they have phenomenal technology? Absolutely. But they're not the only companies to embrace the cloud. They're not the only companies to have incredibly powerful data centers or to get mobility. Okay? They have incredible people. And I don't want to hear about the unemployment rate, okay? Talk to anybody in Silicon Valley. They'll say that there is an absolute war for talent right now. If you're a hot developer or engineer, just a top tier person, you could basically go anywhere. I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about the implications that has for rewards. I talked to a vice president in research in the book at Google. He said, can you talk to me a little bit about succession planning? I said, what's, what's the philosophy there? He said, 70%. What do you mean by that? By 70%, they want to be, let's say they lose a person, right? P Facebook poaches a VP or a developer or whatever, and they're looking to promote from within. They don't want to be 100% certain that the new person can do that job, right? Can you ever be 100% certain? I would argue no. Now, you don't want to be 20% certain, right? I don't know. The guy's never coded in his life. <laughs> <laughs> so he said 70%. We want to be 70% confident that people can actually do the job. They can stretch into the roles. And for them, that's a good number. This is a little dated, uh, but for obvious reasons, Apple may, and companies like Amazon may not make their org charts public. 
But I want to note here that Steve Jobs isn't. at the top of the pyramid he's at the center of apple and obviously he's no longer with us and tim cook has replaced him but someone like jonathan ive who's the head of design is still there by the way uh, if you get a chance if you didn't see this go google jonathan ive's new house just bought one in silicon valley it's it's ridiculous uh, beautiful so some of the names have changed but fundamentally apple has its core leader at its center and it's organized around different product areas which actually when i was uh, researching the book found that this was actually very common if you look at what Larry Page did in 2008, he took over for Eric Schmidt. Schmidt became chairman of the board. Page had discovered that the Google, when it had 10 or 20 or 100 employees, was actually very different than the Google that has, with Motorola, what, 35,000? It's a big number, even though they just laid some people off. So he organized Google around seven key product areas. We're talking about maps and commerce, social, Android, Chrome, YouTube, search, and ads. Okay, so you're organized around different product areas, and in fact, Facebook basically did the same thing. He said, we're going to be a public company very soon. We need to be nimble. And management experts for years have talked about this sort of inherent tension between centralization and decentralization. I used to joke with some of my friends that there was this cycle, right? You get everything centralized, right? And seven years later, oh, we're too bureaucratic, right? We gotta be decentralized. Well, it's too chaotic, right? So how do you maintain the benefits of both? I'd argue that these companies do it and try to get the boast world, it's, it's not perfect, but they want to be organized around products. They want to be nimble. Okay, they don't really think about departments in traditional terms. They don't really think about hierarchies. They want to be ambidextrous. They want to empower these line executives. They want to be able to move very quickly. Can you imagine if an opportunity like Motorola came up and you had to get everyone on board with it? I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like you can do that kind of acquisition willy-nilly, but you want to be able to move quickly. And if you want to empower these executives, So what are the lessons around structures? I would argue that these companies are really organized, in my words, around planks, right? And it's not always easy to do. Uh, if you want to look at Google's arguably most challenged plank, which, which is this sort of geo commerce type thing with Google Wallet, well, that's still rapidly evolving, right? Not that it's easy to run the Chrome business or the search business, but there's a lot of uncertainty in that type of job. And in fact, the person that they hired to run that business, from what I read, isn't working out, so that person may not be with the company anymore. But you're organized around these planks. Even though it may be a tough job, somebody has to do it. Having Google broken into traditional departments, I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. Shapes matter. Think circles, not pyramids. I shudder to think about running everything up through the chain and everything going back down. I mean, if you look at what Jobs did, this was a fascinating piece of the um, Jobs biography, when they were actually building the new Apple campus. Uh, some of you might know this story. He said, I don't want it to have corridors and hallways. I want this to be a very centralized place. In fact, I only want there to be one big bathroom for the men and the women. And finally, someone said to Jobs, you tell me that pregnant women are going to have to, a massive building, thousands and thousands of people, pregnant women are going to have to walk a quarter of a mile to go to the bathroom. So finally, he relented. But he wanted these, this sort of general area in which you could run into someone and go, hey, what are you working on? Okay. So less about you know, the sort of standard office space type cubes. The leader really is at the center of the company. Was there any doubt that Steve Jobs was running Apple? Right? Ditto Mark Zuckerberg with, face, uh, with Facebook or Jeff Bezos with um, Amazon. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but the structure should enable an innovation, not stifle it. There was a Vanity Fair article a couple of months ago about Microsoft. Did anyone happen to read that? fascinating read about stacked ranking in General Electric. We're going to come back to that, but long story short, Microsoft was organized in such a way, not only not to encourage collaboration and innovation, but in many ways to discourage it. We're going to come back to that. Rewards. We're not here just talking about what you get every week or every two weeks, right? Compensation is a lot more complicated than that. We're talking about bonuses, stock options, restricted stock grants. A couple of, it might have been a year ago now actually, Google was losing a lot of employees to Facebook. Facebook was poaching people left and right, high quality people, a lot of developers. Well, Facebook hadn't gone public yet. It was still the hot place to be. Not saying that it isn't now, but the sort of tarnish, uh, it's being tarnished a little bit by the stock price dropping about 50%. So Google took what was then an unprecedented move and it raised employee salaries by 30 to 40%. That's not just <laughs> little thing. You're talking about millions and millions of dollars, but they wanted to stop the hemorrhaging. Was it entirely successful? No, it wasn't. There still was some attrition. 
But beyond just giving people big bumps in pay, Google went so far as to tie every employee's compensation to success with Google+. Google realizes that social networks and media are essential. They're not going anywhere, whatever Facebook stock price happens to be. The way we search for things now by going to Google may not be the same way we do it in five years. In fact, I, I tell this story a lot when I give talks. Two years ago, a little bit more, I was thinking about buying a Mac. Could I have gone to Google and typed in benefits of converting from a PC to a Mac? Sure. Didn't do it. Went to Facebook. Posted. Status update. Thinking of buying a Mac. What do you guys think? Mac owners, talk to me. And within an hour, 12 people responded with, you're a geek, you'll love it. And you know what? I went out, bought a Mac, loved it. Every time I use a PC now, it doesn't work for me. So that kind of search could happen millions of times, not done on Google, which means what? Less revenue for search. Facebook is very um, open to doing that. In fact, if you watch the um, recent talk that Zuckerberg gave, he was being interviewed by Michael Arrington, and he hinted very strongly that Facebook was actually going to do something with search. I would argue you can already use Facebook for search, right? But in the future, perhaps, maybe search is not just what's a good Italian restaurant, but which Italian restaurants in Manhattan have my friends seen in the last six months? Google can't do that, right? Maybe Facebook can in a couple years. So if you think that search has been perfected, you're wrong. Search will evolve the same way search evolved from 15 years ago. So keeping employees there is essential. But it is not just about the money. I think this thing times out. OK. The work really is the reward. If you're a developer, you want to build something cool. Yes, you want to be paid a lot of money. But you want to feel like you're doing something meaningful. OK? And there is a really interesting book. Anyone read it? Show of hands. Dan Pink, Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. I, I think it's a fascinating book. He talks about the secret to high performance and satisfaction at work, at school, at home. It's this deeply rooted need we have to connect in our lives. OK, it isn't necessarily just about making more money. Uh, in the book, actually in the third book, I talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Of course, you need certain, a certain level of income to sustain yourself to pay your bills, but you really want to feel like you're working on something that matters. Okay. With rewards, I want to come back to Microsoft for a second, because in that Vanity Fair article, they talked about GE and stacked ranking, which was all the rage, I think, 25 years ago with Jack Welch. So let's take everyone at this table. You all report to me. Okay. So we've got six people. One of you is a rock star. It's you. One of you <laughs> is, needs to be managed out, only because you're sitting there. Congratulations. <laughs> Everyone in the middle is average, right? I can't have six rock stars on my team. I'm too easy of a manager, right? Even though you're all amazing, right? You're all incredible. You, you do things that other people can't even dream of. I can only give one of you the top ranking. So where's your incentive to collaborate with someone else? You're actually going to be competing with each other, not to mention everyone at this table. So you, only, you not only had a disincentive, a strong one, to cooperate within your team, but between teams. And that was just a big, big problem at Microsoft. You had no reason to collaborate with anybody else because you were probably helping the competition. These companies, don't get me wrong, everybody at Facebook is not a rock star and did or Google. They have employees who aren't working out, but I can have more than one good person on my team. Okay, process. These companies, for better or worse, don't always follow the rules and the process. In fact, it seems to be um, the opposite. Innovate first, ask questions later. And these companies have all gotten in trouble for this. And hopefully in the book I do a good job of not exactly canonizing them. They've all made mistakes. They've all pushed things too fast, too far without getting approval. Uh, in Europe, for instance, um, Street View for Google violated privacy statutes and they got in a whole lot of trouble with the union, uh, European Union. But when you're trying to innovate and do things really quickly, you can't necessarily have someone going, we're not following the process here. Okay? And these companies, as I said, innovate first and ask, que ask questions later. Sometimes they're innovating and they don't know how something will be used. Uh, Google's kind of famous for this, although it actually was suspended recently, this 20% rule with engineers. For one day a week, they got to work on whatever they wanted. As I said, when Larry Page took over, he actually killed a lot of projects like Google Health, uh, iGoogle, uh, there were a few others, because he felt that the company was becoming unfocused. So it's not like you should always let people innovate and do whatever the heck they want, or you should never let people innovate. I'm talking here from a management perspective about trying to strike a healthy balance. But blindly following the rules and worrying about failure absolutely inhibit innovation. 
Uh, failure, I would argue, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It was a Thomas Edison said, I didn't invent the light bulb. I invented 999 ways not to invent it. Okay? So you want to fail fast. But again, there are limits to this. Iterate. We talked before a little bit about Agile and Scrum methods as opposed to, say, the waterfall methods. And for those of you who may not be terribly technical, let me just explain it very simply. Um, hold up my first book, the Why New Systems Fail. Uh, who would you give that to? There you go. In that book, I write about a lot of waterfall projects, and I worked on many of them. And waterfall is essentially a very linear approach to deploying and developing software. So you sit down with my team, and I get all the business requirements. Okay? Take the business requirements, then I design the system, I test the system, and I activate the system. That's the theory. Unfortunately, as 300 or so pages of that book prove, theory and practice often collide. As an alternative to the waterfall method, there are more agile methods. So it's not about a, deploying a system or an app or a plank in the platform with it perfected, right? That doesn't exist. But Google's done the same with Google+. You might launch Google+, and then based on feedback or based on some bugs, make some tweaks. If you look at the first version of the Kindle Fire, uh, the, it, it forked a version of Android, and it was very slow. So a couple weeks later, Amazon took the feedback, made some tweaks, and it was faster. Okay, so we're talking here about waterfall, agile type methods. Why embrace them? Because I would argue that a product is never perfect, work isn't linear, and user needs are always going to change. Right? I, these products are never finished, these platforms are always evolving. I really don't think that even in one or two years, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google will be exactly the same. And even if it is exactly the same to me as the user, I guarantee you, say, Google is making a tweak on the back end to make its algorithm more efficient. So you're never going to get things right on the first try. It doesn't mean that you should turn out a shoddy product, but uh, as we talked about before, one of my favorite quotes is from Voltaire, the perfect is enemy of good. Uh, okay. I absolutely love this one. At Facebook, employees don't bring an idea to their managers. They bring prototypes. Right? You don't want to say, hmm, what if, what if, what if. Someone's going to say, yeah, build it. Okay. Now, this is obviously easier when we're talking about digital products, right? It's not like you're saying, yeah, build a car, maybe it works, or launch a drug, hopefully it won't kill anyone, right? <laughs> At Google, and even for my friend in the human resources department, there's a saying, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So human resources sometimes isn't known as the most sort of data-oriented field. But at Google, if you're trying to make the argument that you ought to be recruiting from a school or you ought to be hiring a certain type of person, Where's your data to back it up? And that permeates even the human resources department. Anyone ever hear of A-B testing? Show of hands. Okay. There was a fantastic Wired article a couple of months ago about how companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google use A-B testing. And it dispelled this myth that there is one Amazon, Apple, or Facebook homepage. In fact, that's not true. So I may go to Amazon.com, right, and I log in with my email, my username. So I'm seeing a version of the Amazon.com website, but you're seeing something slightly different. Now, it's not apples and oranges. If you ever go to the web time back machine, that's a trip. Or there was one site I saw a couple of months ago, GeoCity Eyes Your Site. So you can take any website and make it look like it was done in GeoCities. So it doesn't look that primitive. But you'll see tweaks. Maybe the search bar is different. Maybe the colors are off. Maybe there's a different font or a different feature. But they won't just do that for one or two people, they'll do that for 10 or 20,000. Now when you have Amazon's user base of 300 or 400 million credit cards on file, you can do that and you can basically prove with a reasonable amount of statistical significance that there is a better way to do something. Again, you're bringing data, you're doing sort of prototyping. So there are actually many different types of pages and based on the feedback, based on the results, whether it's a number of products purchased, time on site, bounce rate, whatever, They'll actually then roll that out to everybody. When Facebook launched Timeline, for instance, it wasn't available for everyone all the time, right? They rolled it out at first to see what the uh, results would be. Okay. So implications for libraries. I had made a couple of um, tweaks to this right before, and I talked about continuous evolution and failing fast, and it's about culture more than technology. But I think about the current state of the budget and based on the conversations we had, I'm going to turn it over to questions in a little bit. I think it's just really important to be bold and decisive. You're never going to get everyone within an organization, much less all over the country, to agree on everything. 
And for those of you who didn't hear now, I, I mentioned it dinner at night, I mentioned it before, I think there are th basically three types of people in the world. This is my very simplified view of life. The people who get it, love those people. The people who don't get it but want to get it, okay, I can deal with that. And then the people who don't get it and they're never going to get it. And I want to spend as little time with those people as possible. Now, it's easier for me to say as an independent speaker and author as opposed to OCLC, which is a membership organization, you don't want to completely alienate your members. But I guess my point is that if you're trying to make everybody happy, you're going to make nobody happy. There's a great saying from the NFL, if you've got two starting quarterbacks, you got zero, right? So uh, don't even try. So this is me, and I think we've got plenty of time for some questions. So um, if you want to step right up and uh, ask me whatever you like, we're good. We also will be accepting questions via the WebEx participants, and they're going to submit those via chat. And I don't think, would it be good for uh, Phil to say that over the microphone for the WebEx folks? <laughs> I don't know that the WebEx folks can hear my microphone, so if you can sure. just mention that we're taking For those of you on WebEx, feel free to submit the questions, and they'll be read to me, and I'll do my best to answer them. I answered every question. Wow, I'm good. Yeah. Um, do you want to do the microphone? Yeah, oh, sure. Why not? Should we pass that around, or how do you want to do that? Who wants to be Donahue? Am I dating myself? <laughs> no. I've, I've got a question about... Um, how far ahead of your membership can you get? You said be bold and decisive. Those are not two traits, and I'm a librarian myself. That's not, those are not two traits that will be used to define most librarians. So how far ahead can we get? Uh, you know, you don't want to outrun your supply lines. So what do you think? I wish I could give you the easy answer for that. I'd say that if you're so far ahead that nobody's on board, that's probably too far. The other problem is that you're not far ahead enough, and that group of people, the ones who get it, you, the ones that you think could be really useful examples or really exemplars for others, if they're saying, hey, you guys are too slow, I wouldn't put it to a vote. I guess that's my point. And, and I think that surveys and focus groups are fine. Jobs was obviously famous for um, for going focus groups. And what was it, the um, Henry Ford quote? If we ask customers what we want, they'd say we want a faster horse. Um, but. There have to be people out there, librarians, uh, employees, third parties, that can see where things are going. I mean, I would say that if you're not embracing some of these technologies, some of these platforms with a little p, they're not going anywhere. I'd also argue that if you're not embracing platform thinking and you run into, and I'm sure you, you do this with some of your colleagues, people who say, well, the library always has done this and always should do this. Well. Given the current budgetary state, is that really a tenable position? So aside from different technologies and features for applications that we talked about, what different things can people do? And rather than think about it theoretically, are there librarians out there that are actually doing interesting things? And can you kind of hold them up as examples and, and talk about the data and the results? Because they launched a new WordPress class or how to use an iPad or whatever, they actually had 50% uh, more uh, attendance than they normally did, you know, that type of thinking. Who knows, you can have a class on iPads and it gets ignored, but I bet you it won't be. I was at an Apple store in Vegas four months ago and there was a problem with my MacBook Pro and this was one of the best moments I had in Vegas. There was probably a 78-year-old woman taking a course on how to use her iPad. <laughs> so how, how do you sponsor cultural change within an organization where you've got deeply embedded processes and tradition there and, and a lot of baggage that's always pulled along and that, never anything that's lumped off on the on, on the end. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, can you repeat the question also and answer? Sure. Um, I guess the question was how do you uh, account for the dead weight, if I can paraphrase? Yeah. Um, or culturally, how do you get everybody on board? electric shocks. I mean, I guess you can <laughs> offer the carrot and the stick, right? I would probably focus less on the people who are, they're always going to find a reason not to do something, right? And hopefully they'll eventually find another line of work or they're just, you realize that you can't convert them. Um, there are people every day who quit Facebook because they don't like a privacy change, someone got in trouble because, they, I mean, they realize though that they're moving for the most part forward. They're gaining more members than they're losing. I, I don't think that you can. I'm, answer your question, get it right for everybody. There's always going to be, I mean, how many thousands of people are we talking about, uh, members? How many? 70, 80? 
More? I mean, are they are going to agree on anything? So I, I don't mean to be defeatist or smug, but I don't think that you can do that. I would spend my time focusing on the people who do. Um, doesn't mean that you should necessarily refuse their checks, but you're probably going to get more mileage by focusing on the people who do get it. I, I, don't, I wish I could answer your question and say, well, if you do these five things, in fact, one of the things of which I'm most proud in the book is that there is no 10-point checklist. I can't tell you the 10 things you should do to be the next Google or Amazon or Apple or Facebook. I'm just not that smart. So, Phil, I'm going to bring up the great word, competition. So, as we started shifting our strategy into cloud, into web scale, et cetera, there were a lot of our alternative service providers who took a wait and see. Let's, let's hope they fail. Mm -hmm. basically. And then we'll keep doing business as usual. But when we didn't, um, suddenly the, the platform has been embraced by the library industry. So, what I sometimes call the first time in the history of the library industry where what's happening in the outside world the same language and strategies are being used in the, in the library world. So when you talk about those five things, strategy, people, rewards, process, structure, and we're trying to be better or continue to set ourselves apart, you know, when the platforms become a commodity in this, in this space, how do we, what, what things do we focus on to be better than the rest of uh, an industry that's trying to catch up with us? Because they eventually will, right, maybe. So okay, so the fear is how do you constantly stay ahead yeah. of the rest. Yeah. Good question. I, I, I don't have the answer. I mean, there could always be some kind of breakthrough. And, and that's, forget just libraries or OCLC. I mean, you look at the steps that Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google are taking. I mean, um, why did, for instance, um, for those of you from not familiar, Apple just dropped for iOS 6 Google Maps. Because I think it was six, seven months ago, Apple bought a Maps company. And it made some tweaks. And now, there isn't even an app, to my knowledge, that you can run now on iOS 6. So why did Apple get rid of Google Maps? Google Maps is clearly the better product. For those of you, if you're inclined, Google cartoons on Apple Maps. And they're hysterical. you got these aliens, right, going, well, we're using the iPhone. We can't, where the hell's our, right? <laughs> so why, why did, and some people were saying, is this a sign that Steve Jobs is no longer there, right? Because he was all about the user experience, and now they have pretty clearly an inferior product on iOS 6. Well, they're afraid of Google. So arguably, they're taking a step back because they think that the next version of Apple Maps will be better, but will it ultimately be better? I, I don't know if, I mean, I'm sure someone has already jailbroken it, right? Someone has probably figured out a way on an iPhone 5 or with iOS 6 to use Google Maps, or maybe there's someone trying to tie into the Google Maps API. I don't know if you can always stay ahead of people. I don't think that the case, you should make the case that ours is the best, right? When you're on these platforms, I personally think that Google is the best search engine. Um, but there are some other ones out there that are actually very good. Wolfman Alpha is one of them. It's sort of an obscure one, but it gives you really good results. But when I'm on the Google platform and using the different planks, I write about this in the book, if every other site on the web went down and I can only use one to be reasonably productive, it would be Google, hands down. Is Facebook chat the best chat client out there? No, it's not. But if otherwise, if I want to use Skype, right, I got to find out the person's username on Skype. Maybe they don't have Skype. I got to convince them. All my friends are on Facebook. It's good enough. So I wouldn't focus as much on constantly being better. Are you offering things that just make it easier? And I think in the case of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, they do. Uh, even if you don't want to talk about the gang of four, I'm a big WordPress guy. And for those of you who don't know, WordPress is a free content management application that you can download for the web. I've been told by really technical people that it's not the best software. And even though I'm a pretty technical guy, I don't want to spend my time trying to work on something that isn't as user friendly. So maybe the question isn't necessarily, are we always going to be better than competition, but are you meeting most of their needs and making it, and instead they had to use 12 apps or five apps, and now they can just use one platform? A good question. Phil, so we have a question from one of our virtual participants. Um, as a member-based organization, do you see anything OCLC can take advantage of when it comes to building out our platform? Sure. Are the members incentivized in any way to actually not just use the platform but contribute to it? Are there tools, av tools available for some of the partners or some of the members to actually take the platform in different directions? I'm not just talking about complaining. 
right, or having an email address. <laughs> but is there a way to let them actually develop different things? That way, this is not something coming from corporate or from the center, it's actually coming from the fringes, right? The beauty of ecosystems, in my opinion, is that through APIs and SDK software development kits, anyone can get an app in the App Store, as long as it's approved, right? And that's an important distinction because it's not a totally open platform like Android. Android is sort of the wild, wild west. When people talk about Android, the next question is always, well, which version, right? Everyone knows if you're on, say, iOS, you're using Apple. And I say that anybody could develop an app because you're looking at a guy who has an app. It's not the world's most sophisticated one, but for my third book, The New Small, I developed an app with the help of a, of a development firm. And now I can dispense technology tips over the web, and then they'll show up on iPhones. Now, it's not downloaded as many times as Angry Birds, but dare to dream. But again, anybody can do it. The point is that when you do that, then I would argue that Apple is taking a third, uh, it used to be a dollar. Actually, at first it was $1.99. And I have people going up to me going, who the hell do you think you are? Right, because that's way too expensive. So then I made it a dollar. When people bought it for a dollar, Apple got 30 cents. So there was an incentive for Apple to approve the app, but there was also an incentive for me to build it. So I, I don't think that the members should just follow. If I had my druthers, I'd also let them leave. We have another question from a virtual participant. Do you see any difference between a nonprofit platform and a for-profit platform? It's a good question. I'd argue that in a big picture, the answer is no. Tim O'Reilly, um, the guy who coined Web 2.0, runs O'Reilly Publishing, has talked quite a bit about open government and government as a platform. I think that same kind of thinking needs to exist, right? What kind of APIs are out there, what can some developer do to tie into a transit system or to a library system or to the post office? Um, whether or not you can make money off of that, I don't know, but again, I think it comes back to the difference between platforms with a little p and platforms with a big thing, p. When I spoke in June at a postal conference, they were talking about the post office as a platform, and the last thing that I said was that I think we need to think broader. I, I don't want to have separate platform for different parts of government. I actually think about different planks and maybe it'll evolve this way in the future, but I'd like to see that you can use some of these common data sources, some of these standards, to enable platforms throughout. That way you've got somebody in Wisconsin or Ohio or Nebraska developing a really cool app <coughs> that takes advantage of the technology, but then is open for others. And someone's gonna go, oh, that's cool, what if it does this? So it's not so much top down as it is bottom up. Um, but it's obviously a lot easier if you're a developer because you're gonna make a certain amount of money. In fact, um, RIM, makers of BlackBerry, talk about falling from grace. They're now offering developers with BlackBerry uh, BBX10, I think it is, $10,000 to develop an app. Now, could the government do that? I don't see why not. There are these funding platforms like Kickstarter. So if you're a government and you've got a budget of a million dollars to develop something, why not say, you know what, what if we throw it on one of these websites and we'll offer people $50,000 and it's a contest. There are contests type sites out there to solve problems. But it's that type of thinking that I think in the public sector, particularly not to get myself in trouble, is often very lacking, right? Because things tend to be very top down. I've worked that first book as a couple of case studies from government projects. Things tend to be very top down. People in public sector, in my experience, don't like giving up that control. They want the headcount, they want the department, they want the responsibility. When I talk about the age of the platform, I say, uh, consulting gigs or speaking gigs, I say, forget the technology for a minute. Are you ready to give up control? That's to me one of the biggest problems. Doesn't mean it has to be the wild, wild west like Android, but when you have, I think Apple now has 600,000 or 700,000 apps. I guarantee you one right now is violating Apple's terms of service. And there was one uh, social network called Path that got slacked because it was stealing email addresses and it wasn't supposed to do that. So that's a problem but look at all the benefits, look at all the things you can do. So if you're looking for a reason not to do something, you can always find one. Um, I think it's a little trickier when you're talking about the government because if healthcare data gets out or social security numbers, that's a lot different than oops, now somebody knows that I call such and such a person twice a day. Other questions? What was your favorite movie again, Todd? Were you a Spinal Tap guy? Uh, Star Wars. Star Wars, okay. Um, so, uh, how is organizing around the plank different from organizing around the product? Hmm. Well, in many cases, I would argue that products actually are planks. 
Plank is just my general term for a product or a service or an app. I don't necessarily know that it's different. In fact, Google, as I said before, is organized around seven major product areas. They don't call them planks. Um, I don't know that it is necessarily different. Uh, in my experience, though, people who tend to own a product and don't have the platform thinking might say, you know, like, look at Microsoft, look at Windows, and look at um, Office. There's a fascinating piece on CNET about a year ago I read about how there was actually, within Microsoft in the mid-2000s, a key group of people who were actually working on a tablet well before the iPad or, or the Nexus. And when it got to the highest levels of the organization, up to the top of the pyramid, at the Steve Ballmer level, the fundamental question was, how does this help Windows and how does this help Office? And the short answer was, it doesn't. Killed the project and the guys responsible for the tablet at Microsoft within two or three months left for creative differences. Right? They were upset. So to me, if there is any difference at all, and I'm not always sure that there is one, if you kind of own the product and you want to protect it, that kind of contravenes this notion that it's more open, if not totally open, in which other people can improve upon it. Other questions? Yeah. I do have a question. So um, a lot of the, the examples here are mostly consumer driven. And you said to really be successful, we have to have focus on the consumer. So yes. in your experience, for those organizations that have been successful with the platform, but they focus on business to business, what do they do differently? Do they have certain free things out there that bring people to them and they also hope that they then Sure. I mean, the other services as well. Yeah, I mean, look at look at what Microsoft did. Was it six months ago? It dropped 1.2 billion dollars on Yammer. Because for those of you who don't know, Yammer is a sort of um, social software, basically Facebook for the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And Yammer operated on a freemium model. So you would download Yammer, and it was very different than the sort of top-down procurement process. I know we talked about procurement a little bit before. You'd have people in organizations, whether on their laptops or desktops or maybe even on their phone using it, and it, I forget how it broke, whether you got to a certain number of users or certain functionality, but Yammer did really well and was used, I don't know how many times it was downloaded, but it was a lot, because people were already using it. So if you're the CIO or someone has to make the purchasing decision, oh, we already use it, we already like it, that's a good thing. So why did Microsoft pony up $1.2 billion for something that arguably it had to some extent with something like SharePoint? For those of you who don't know, Microsoft SharePoint is this I would argue still relatively clunky. <laughs> it's not a cloud-based thing you could just download and set up. And, and I've worked with SharePoint for, for years in different capacities, but because it was so clunky, people say, oh, the hell with it. I'm just going to throw it into Excel. Uh, again, my experience, I'm sure there are people out there that are doing amazing things with it, but it is not this viral type of thing. Yeah. So if you're the enterprise, then you want it to be used in that way. And there was another company, Jive Software, actually, that just went public. In fact, if you look at a lot of the enterprise companies out there going public, uh, Splunk is another one, they're actually doing better than some of the consumer ones out there. So I, I don't think that it's totally different um, because I can download whatever apps I want without IT stopping me. And yes, you can lock down PCs, we all know that. I, I don't know if it's fundamentally different. I still think though that for the, the Jaws and the Yammers of the world, you know, Microsoft wasn't necessarily buying it for the technology. I mean, Microsoft has the money. Microsoft was probably buying it for the users. And in a way, I would argue that's some, to some extent similar to what Facebook did with Instagram. Uh, what was it? A, basically a billion dollars in cash and stock for a company with, forget no profits, no revenue. Why? It had 30 million users. So what's that? How's that not $33 as a user acquisition cost? Again, maybe Facebook's crazy, but the stock was high. And if you look at what Google did with YouTube, I would argue it's not totally out of line. Now, whether Facebook can monetize it, who knows, I don't have a, um, a silver ball. So I, I don't necessarily think that it's different in the enterprise space. Uh, obviously, IT departments can lock things down a lot harder than what I can do at home, or a lot easier, I should say. 